Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the Cedar Falls Community School District Board of Education meeting on this Monday, March 8th. Uh, if you are joining us from home, you can find the agenda on our website under the board. Uh, it will be on the right side and click down on the menu and you can follow along and all the materials that we'll be discussing this evening can also be found there. Uh, before I begin, I have to read a brief statement because we continue to meet in a hybrid fashion. Uh, but this states that a government body may conduct a meeting by electronic means only in circumstances where such a meeting in person is impossible or impractical and only if the governmental body proves, provides public access to the conversation of the meeting to the extent reasonably possible. The place of the meeting is the place in which the communication originates and the minutes of the meeting shall include a statement explaining why the meeting in person was impossible or impractical as pursuant to Iowa Code 21.8. And of course, we continue to meet in hybrid fashion due to the ongoing pandemic. So calling the meeting now to order, we will move into the first order of business is a public hearing for the 2021-2022 uh, school year calendar. And I have in my possession an affidavit of publication showing that the notice of time and place of hearing for the 2021-22 Cedar Falls uh, school calendar was published in the Waterloo Courier, Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier on February 26, 2021. The board will now hold a hearing. So is there anyone who would like to make a comment in regards to the school calendar for next year? Seeing none, we will close that hearing. Uh, moving now to the next item on the agenda, it is a public hearing for the proposed issuance of approximately $32.9 million in school infrastructure sales services and use tax revenue bonds. And I have in my possession an affidavit of publication showing that the notice of time and place of hearing for the issuance of sales tax bonds uh, was published in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier on February 23, 2021. The board will now hold a hearing. So if there's anyone who would like to speak in regards to the issuance of those sales tax bonds, please indicate now. All right, seeing no comment, this hearing is now closed. We'll move on now to the consent ag agenda, item D, which do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Alan. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Susie. Second, any comments from any board members? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Moving now to the public comment section. We have two speakers here this evening. I just wanna remind, of course, our speakers that all comments should remain pro pro professional in nature and not be specific to any one individual to maintain everyone's privacy. I'd also ask that they be germane to the, Cedar, to the school district uh, and the business of educating our, uh, our students. And so I think one thing that's always helpful too as well, uh, so for our two speakers, it's always helpful for the board and anyone watching, if you could also indicate what your relationship is with the school district to put it in perspective for everyone uh, listening, including the board members. So with that, uh, I will uh, start by recognizing Joyce Livingston. Joyce, go ahead. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, my name is Joyce Levinson, and not that I have to do this, but um, I'm a parent to three children in the Cedar Falls School District, so, um, and have one graduate. So, uh, tonight I just wanted to talk about some challenges that I've personally faced while trying to advocate for my child. So the purpose of me doing this is so we can really talk about how parental participation is sometimes received um, within the district. So I had a lack of support once I started exploring options that the school didn't suggest um, with my child. So the school suggested like a whole bunch of um, different things, like I take my child to the doctor or maybe my child has <clears throat> ADHD or um, needs medication like Ritalin. That was uh, very much pushed up on me um, listening to the folks at the school who um, I felt comfortable working with. So I definitely was trying to um, take into consideration their thoughts as well. Um, but then they suggested that he be isolated from other students and he's now in fifth grade and he's really just learning how to socialize because that was stripped from him um, from the very beginning of him starting school. 
Uh, the staff at the school created labels for my son by talking about him in the teacher lounge and amongst each other. Um, I grew up in the Cedar Falls School District and in Cedar Falls, and so I have friends, a lot of friends, um, who actually teach in these schools and um, felt bad and guilty enough to come and tell me that this was happening about my son, which made it almost impossible for him to make friends because people basically were scared of him and just thought he was like a bad kid. Um, <clears throat> also, once I asked to put race on the table, I received a lot of fragility from the staff. So I shared many, many reasons that I'm guessing went untouched or unread. Um, they refused to acknowledge that racism even existed within the school and that my son was the problem. So finally, um, they found a way for us to be pushed out of the school by not allowing any communication between me and my teacher and my son's teacher even though knowing that he was in special education and daily communication was necessary with me and my son um, and his teacher. Um, once I brought up race, we were quickly pushed out of the school. My son now attends a new school in the district that accepts him as being a young black boy. We dissect issues related to race. They listen and they're willing to learn from me and my team that I'm lucky to have for my son. Um, this is how I know that one, racism exists in the school, Two, that it can be addressed appropriately, but it needs to be happening at every school, not just a select few. Um, I would advise the committee to also take a look at the number of minority students who are being forced into special education because of the way they are and act are not familiar to your educators. Thank you for your comments, Joyce. I would like to recognize now Catherine Mahoney. Are you connected, Catherine? Yes, I am. All right, go ahead. Okay. I would like to um, give you all a resource. There's a Facebook group called Anti-Racist Education Now. And I've been joined and followed that, and it's also posted in another group I'm a part of called Women's March Iowa. And so they dissect the race issues. And so a woman who's in that group and contributes wrote this, and this is from Nehu Soti, and she posted, let's take a moment to acknowledge that meetings about anti-racism among educators can actually perpetuate racism. And so she writes, I've been really grappling with this time when anti-racism has become trendy, and now everyone wants to be facilitating the work, meaning white people want to facilitate this work when they have not done the work themselves. In many ways, I think anti-racist work has been stolen from black, indigenous, people of color, and is in the process appropriated by white people and whitewashed by us. So she suggests if you are a white person in these meetings, number one, Make sure you don't speak about all black indigenous people of color or students of color as one blob. If you mean black students, say black students. Don't use coded language to make yourself feel better. Three, don't center your feelings and how hard it is for you. Four, don't talk about the pain of black indigenous people of color and students quote unquote, out there or in your personal life when there are black indigenous people of color in your actual meeting. That's very offensive. Five, keep it personal. How are you, or for me, and I look at this quite often, how am I perpetuating racism every moment, every day, and how am I going to change that? as something we as white people all need to look at. How am I going to change that? Then um, six, talk about actions you will undertake from now on to dismantle the racial, racial power structure that we are currently benefiting from and constantly benefiting from. She says seven, finally, talk about our, meaning black people's, joy and brilliance. And I think that's so important and so I, I saw that. I hope you guys look at that Facebook page because it's really, really helpful to us as we unpack these things we need to do. 
Thank you for your comments, Catherine. We'll move now to the communications session. Hello. We'll bring the presentation up real quick and have a few things we'll cover. First thing we'll mention is um, the boys basketball made it to state and they played their first game this Wednesday at um, noon down at Wells Fargo Arena. There is of course limitations in regards to the numbers of people that can attend and mask wearing and things like that. So we really encourage everyone to follow the um, Booster Club on Facebook and Twitter to keep updated on all of those um, precautions and things they need to be aware of. And then the Missouri Valley Conference just announced also that Landon Wolf was named Athlete of the Year, Colt Sh Coach Schultz Coach of the Year. And then we had two athletes on the first team and two athletes on the second team. So looking forward to an exciting week for them and wish them the best. Also wanted to mention um, the high school Jazz One was selected to, to perform at the 94th Annual Iowa Band Masters Association Conference this coming May. They recorded three selections and it was part of a blind audition process that they were then chosen for and they will perform a statewide live stream as part of that event. The committee only accepts one high school jazz band to perform and this is the third time that they've been invited to perform at the Iowa Band Masters Association. Previously it was in 2015 and 2018. So congratulations to Mr. Inglehart and then all of those students as well. This is really exciting. This came from um, Kenton Swartley. He actually nominated this student and she was actually just found out that she was awarded a National Center for Women and in Information, Information Technology Aspirations in Computing Award. She was selected from over 4,200 applicants and is the only student from Iowa that was selected for the recognition at the national level and then one of seven students selected as a winner of the Iowa Award as well. And Kenton said that she's very deserving of the award and been an invaluable member of the FIRST Robotics competition team. Zoe has been a key member of our programming team and instrumental in coding our robots, as well as helping to train younger team members. And then within the website, there's this great little profile of her that shows um, a little bit of her background. She got involved in first in seventh grade, um, and then since then has kind of worked her way up within the team and was part of the team that um, was part of the world championships. And then she will be moving on to study at, oh, R Rose Holman Institute of Technology to study software engineering and robotics. So big congratulations to Zoe, she's a senior at the high school. And of course um, to Kenton as well for, we know it takes some effort and energy to make nominations for students and write the recommendation letters. So we're just really glad that we have teachers that are willing to put in that extra effort for the students. We are officially announcing what our groundbreaking is going to be for the new high school. Um, due to all of the COVID restrictions, we are just going to have this be a Facebook Live event. It's going to be on Thursday, March 25th at noon. And logistics-wise, we will be in communication with board members to make sure you're all able to be there and then have some representatives, um, a few students, as well as um, administration and it's from the architecture and then story construction as well. We're lucky enough Channel 15 is going to be there to record it and then be able to do some um, a parent university and some other things that will be able to show it as well. And of course, we'll have media invited, but make sure to watch the district Facebook page for that event and then uh, it'll be on March 25th. Actual things happening could be before that, but this is going to be the day that we're kicking it off. Also wanted to congratulate the girls basketball team. They um, unfortunately came up short in the quarterfinals, but we're still very proud of their whole efforts this last year. And then also the Missouri Valleys um, announced their all division selections for wrestling. So you can see we had quite a few athletes that were a part of that list this year. So congratulations to all of them. And also just for everyone's um, kind of awareness as well, the Waterloo Warriors is actually, um, we have student athletes that participate in that as part of a club program and it's a hockey. And they were actually in the state championship game, um, match game, I may, may have said it incorrectly there. I'm not, not huge hockey in my life. Um, but we wanted to recognize those athletes. They um, came up short in that state championship game, but they have a great presence on Twitter and social media and wanted to acknowledge those students. We are having um, at the end of the month also on the 25th, so it'll be a, a day you can 
attend a lot of things for the district virtually. This is gonna be host, uh, virtual screening and then panel hosted on that Thursday, March 25th, starting at six. The event is free and open to the public and you can register right from the homepage, cfschools.org. You'll just click on the image of the movie uh, like there, it'll be across the home page, and then you can go right into an, a Zoom, an event that you can um, register for, and then you'll get the link for when that'll be live on the 25th. Really want to mention Julie Rouse, she's a school counselor at Holmes Junior High, and she's been a big force behind getting this organized and then getting the panels put together as well. So we really hope lots of people will take advantage of this because it's definitely on the topics of social media and its effects on our brain, especially for teenagers, and it's really important for all of our parents and our students to be a part of. Also wanted to mention on our equity resources page and then within our e-newsletter, we're sharing lots of things this was just shared last week in our e-newsletter. This is some local events and activities that are happening. The 1619 Project is a discussion that's being hosted by the Waterloo Human Rights Commission, Cedar Falls Human Rights Commission, and Embrace. And you can go on to that Facebook event and then be part of that conversation. And then also UNI has a quest toward racial equity, cultivating justice, a quest toward racial equity that they've opened up to Cedar Valley residents and you can sign up online. So these are just a few of the great resources we have throughout the Cedar Valley that we think are important for our families, our parents, and even our students if able to participate in and learn more. And a quick reminder, we have almost made it to spring break. No school this Friday because it's conferences week and then no school next week due to spring break. Of course, make sure to follow us on all of our social media channels. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tara Quick, unless there's any questions from the board for me. Um, I just have a quick question about uh, some of the virtual events. Are people outside of the district able to register and watch if they choose, like the, the like uh, filming? Yes, it is okay. open to anyone in the public. Yeah, okay. anybody anywhere can really register for that and be part of that conversation. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hello, I am here just to give a quick equity update for you today. Last time that the board meet, uh, met on the 22nd, our team came and uh, um, gave a, a pretty, well, we didn't come, we came virtually and, uh, and we we're able to, to give you an update with all of our equity work. And so today is just a quick follow up. On the 22nd, we received um, a statement and concerns uh, at that board meeting. So um, following that on the 25th, we convened with our equity committee and we really reviewed those, um, each statement, took those seriously, and that committee discussed areas um, that we've already met within our plan. Um, and then we also discussed areas that we could improve, additional trainings, additional things that we could do better. As a reminder, our action plan is really centered around um, four groups, our students, our staff, our system, and our community. So what are we doing within each of, of those areas to make improvement? So we really believe that we're better together. The more that we know, the better that we're going to do. And um, I, I think our goal next would be to be able to sit down with those people and have a conversation about the statements and, um, and the concerns further. I think we're all committed to the same goal, which is making it a great place for our kids. Um, so that's just a quick update that we um, have met as a committee, looking at each one of those statements and uh, um, diving in to see how it meets our action plan and how we may need to improve in some areas. Are there questions? Is there any updates on, thank you very much for your report, any updates on the uh, impact or the usage of our new calling um, reporting system, I guess is what I would yeah, absolutely. And Janelle might want to be able to give that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, the really great thing about that um, platform is that it can we can just literally pull lots of data from it. So I can definitely give maybe some more specifics at our next board meeting as far as the numbers that have been submitted. Um, I would say we've had a wide 
um, scope of the kinds of alerts and definitely secondary buildings um, have more alerts than elementary but we've definitely seen good usage of it I believe and it's fulfilling the the needs that we we had hoped but I can definitely bring some more specifics about the numbers and kind of breakdowns of that as for the next meeting yeah that, those are important but I also think your sense of how it's serving its intended need and and uh, how folks who are and in the follow-up process, you know, it, that, that's a big part of it is that yeah. they feel like that somebody heard them and listened to them and followed through with them. And so, I mean, numbers is one thing, but I think how it's, how, how it's resolving. Uh, yeah, issues. I think we can that, definitely talk about that too. Um, just real quick, when the alert comes in, um, I'm the first one that gets the notification of it. And then I work directly with, if it's a student or a staff concern with Adrian or Tara, yeah. And then we take it to then um, that building or the appropriate people within that building to focus on um, that being addressed. And of course, our school resource officer is involved in many of those things as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we have had, we had multiple alerts on um, the concerns we've had recently. So in the sense of people being comfortable using it, I feel like that's going to, um, that has definitely happened in some ways but it's also continuing to spread the word about it for our students. And our school counselors are doing a great job, especially through um, registration. Um, I can't remember exactly when we had just talked about this, but I think the school counselors are mentioning it directly to each student when they have their registration this spring. So they're kind of having a much more um, focused discussion about that that tool is there for them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we can definitely talk more about that then in the next board meeting and yeah. how we're using it. Thank you. I think our intention with, with starting that was really for, for every, anybody to feel comfortable uh, sharing a, a report or a concern that may, maybe they didn't feel comfortable or safe sharing in person. And so that was the intent and it's getting used, which is, which is exactly what we wanted. Other questions? Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to both of you, thank you. Uh, moving now to item G, which is to discuss a resolution for the issuance of the bonds. Uh, Dr. Fiddy, would you like to introduce the subject? Yeah, so this is the uh, resolution supporting the uh, issuance of approximately $32.9 million in school infrastructure sales, service, and use tax revenue bonds. This is uh, to uh, move forward with the school district's, uh, um, I guess, promise that we would use some of our future revenues from the, the one cent sales tax. As we went through the general obligation bond process, uh, we have already issued $10 million in bonds and we said we would issue roughly $43 million in bonds to be able to use those funds to offset the overall impact on property taxes. This uh, resolution does not um, impact uh, the tax levy rate or local property taxes. It is one cent sales tax revenue. Uh, that is given to each district um, according to the uh, statewide calculation. So just as a, a reminder that uh, this is a resolution, uh, at the next meeting we'll have uh, Maggie Berger that will attend. This starts the process for us to go and solicit uh, bids and solicit people to uh, provide the, the issuance uh, so we can come back, have that discussion and potentially approve the uh, who is going to receive that issuance and, and how that money will be received. All right, thank you. I'd ask for a res the resolution in a second and then we can answer any questions. I move that the Cedar Falls Board of Education adopt the resolution supporting the proposed issuance of approximately $32,900,000 of school infrastructure sales, service, and use tax revenue bonds as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second from Nate. Very good, thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, just a, so uh, a follow-up comment. So we've already issued $10 million. So all of this comes against sales tax revenue. So in, I know it's very muffled, but if anyone wants to help us, they can go buy something and pay sales tax and, and, it, and it will help. Um, but so we've, we've issued $10 million. This would be an additional $32.9 million that we approximately that we would issue. How, how much of our bonding capacity will we have used once, do we have any bonding capacity left after this is, after this is issued? 
So we'd have to specifically look at that when we were going through the process using the current estimates of enrollment and, and the from two years ago with the general obligation bond, we, we had a certain band of dollars. I wanted to say it was like $20 million, $30 million that we could actually go above and beyond if you look at the overall coverage rates that you have to acquire. Um, obviously, since then, our enrollment's increased as well as the estimated uh, amount of dollars for save per student. So we would have to recalculate that, and I don't think we have here recently. It's only gone up, but it hasn't decreased. Okay. Okay, so is it the intention that there beyond this, I forget in the grand scheme of things, will this, will this finalize the bonds that we're issuing against that revenue stream of sales tax? And then um, yes. next will be the, the, the other bonds that were authorized by our community? Correct. Okay. I was just gonna mention too, we also take a look at the current bonds that we currently have, which is our series 2013. And at our next meeting, we'll be having those discussions in regards as they're callable. And so we'll be making some of those in order to allow us to continue with um, with our sales tax revenue bonds as well to, to ensure that coverage as well too. Okay, yep. all right, very good. And again, this is just a resolution to start the process for us to then get a get a presentation and then next week right or, or and again meeting. this is not an increase in, in tax to to the tax owners um it is just utilizing that one sense that we have available through the state okay excellent all right so we've moved and seconded any further questions or comments seeing none we'll move to a vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Opposed, same sign motion carries moving now to approval of the construction testing contract yeah, so that is me as well. Um, on the screen, you'll see uh, that there is a just a summary. It did not come across well in the board packet, so I apologize for that. So we, we created a little snippet uh, to, to show the overall estimates and, and the bids that were received. So within the line item of construction costs within our overall budget for the new high school, there was an estimation of $200,000 for testing services. Uh, part of the testing services are for soil testing uh, as we remove the top layer of soil, bring that back in, as well as compaction and um, concrete testing, grout testing to make sure that all of our welds are appropriate and can withstand the uh, bolts and, and uh, different uh, fireproofing mechanisms across the, the building. And within the pack, you can see just the breakdown of where all the, that time comes from, where all the testing comes from. And again, we estimated as we went through the budget that this would be roughly a $200,000 expenditure um, or a line item for that budget. Uh, we did have three bids that came back. Uh, the low bid was for 141366 which was team services. The next lowest was CBT at 146396 And you can see where Terracon and Braun Intertech uh, came in at as well. So we're very pleased. Uh, this is just part of that process of making sure that the end product of, of a building that we know and, and certainly will be a, a source of pride in our community for decades to come is, is built uh, and tested and meets our needs from day one. All right, in a similar fashion, I'd ask for a motion and second, and then we'll move to discussion. I move to accept the recommendation from Story Construction for construction, testing, and inspection services from Team Services Ames, Iowa, in the amount of $141,365.76. As presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jeff. Questions or comments from board members? Uh, looking at the items that are on here, this looks to be more about the the uh, structural soundness of, of the material that we're building on. So it doesn't really have anything to do with perhaps contamination of the soil or anything like that. I assume that we're testing it some other through some other means. Yeah, the, so we've already had some soil sampling and soil testing of the site. So this is more to ensure that there's the, the right compaction uh, as we dig down, you know, well over in some cases 20 feet down that they're doing the soil sampling to make sure that the foundations and the footers have the right level of stability as well as in the backfill as it gets backfilled. So, so maybe just a follow-up question just from a, so we've different players that we've contracted obviously to help us with the construction of the high school. So we have 
obviously Sori Construction, which is our construction manager, yep. and then we awarded a, um, I'm going to call it an oversight entity to make sure the windows don't leak and the operation, the functional operational type of thing. And then this is, so, and then this is a, uh, how, how, I guess, that other group that's testing the oper operability, if you will, of the of the building, and this group, uh, I guess, just to just so people are clear, because I'm, I'm, where are the lines drawn, like between those two groups that are testing to make sure everything is to specifications? Yeah, so there will be some overlap with that, not a significant overlap, but some overlap, and they have to work together. So we will have our construction managers who are on site to ensure that things are constructed, that uh, the timelines are set, that they're working with all of the contractors and subcontractors. We have our testing services that'll come in and test at certain points, certain levels, to make sure that things are uh, of sound, um, I guess, construction as far as the services provided. So with the concrete or the grout, they'll have crush tests and, and cube tests to make sure that they are good quality materials. And then we have the service, and again, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the, the service that we approved about a month and a half ago, that really ensures that things are operating at the efficiency that they are intended to do, then provide the training on those efficiencies for our staff. So it uh, deals with some of the HVAC systems, but also ensuring that there's no leakage with windows, that there's, you know, the roof mem membranes and roofing uh, is, uh, doesn't have leaks. So they do testing, not of the, um, I guess, core construction, but testing of the components that are going to be in the operability of the building. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving now to item I on the agenda, uh, the approval of the uh, high school elevator bids. Yes, yeah, so as everybody recalls, we, we had to rebid the elevator bids uh, for the new high school project. Uh, that was rebid, bids were received, uh, and you can see that that was bid package 14-1. Uh, two bidders uh, did submit bids. The, the low bidder uh, and the recommendation is O'Keefe Elevators for $281,390. Uh, that was uh, actually $49,610 below the estimate. Uh, so you can see that the overall project uh, within the, the board packet is uh, below budget uh, with all of our bid packages in. They're still you know, several variables, but about 91,000, a little over 91,000 under budget at this time. So uh, very pleased and, and happy where the, the bids came in for those elevator bids and um, certainly uh, looking forward to, to the fact that that was under budget and under what we thought would be the line item for that. Excellent, can I have a motion? I move to accept the recommendation from Story Construction for bid package 14-1, new high school elevators as presented today, March 8th, 2021. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jeff. Questions or comments regarding the elevator bids? All right, seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, moving now to approval of custodial bids. Yes, this is our annual request for custodial bids and it's in regards to our proprietary as well as our miscellaneous custodial bids. And uh, within your board packet, you'll see that those two particular bids that were received, uh, one for the proprietary was for uh, Martin Brothers with the recommendation and that would be for uh, those items that require those speci specific services that we have available and for hand soap, paper towels, and toilet tissue. Um, as we were doing the bids, we did find that uh, there has been an increase in cost, and so that this year there is a difference compared to last year. Um, one of the items specifically for uh, the proprietary items was the foaming hand soap. Obviously, our kiddos and our staff members have been utilizing the recommendations of the CDC, and we have had to increase uh, the purchase of that, that usage of the uh, foaming hand soap. The cost is the same, but the, the increase 
from last year is due to the numbers of, of items in which we have to purchase. Also taking a look then at those remainder uh, custodial items uh, with those uh, specific vendors, you'll see the recommendations based on the lowest bids or th with the exceptions of those particular items. Um, but those are anywhere from uh, cash, uh, excuse me, can liners to gloves to uh, bleach. And some of those items, again, we've seen a significant change from last year at this time. Um, some examples. Uh, last year at this time, the bleach was $9.60 a case. This year it's $12.10. Um, the can liners were $10.85. Uh, they are now $13.20. And, and the large one that we discovered was the gloves, the extra large gloves. Um, this, this was a significant change uh, last year prior to the pandemic. Um, it was $18.75 a case. This year it's $88.21. And so obviously you will see a, a, a difference within those supplies that we've received, but we do have those recommendations for Martin Brothers at the $62,280 and then those remaining uh, custodial supplies at $60,908. All right, thank you. Uh, can I get a motion and second and then we'll discuss. I move to accept the custodial proprietary supply bids from Martin Brothers distributing in the amount of $62,280 and the remaining custodial supply bids in the amount of $60,908.18 as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Susie. Questions or comments? Are we able to use, oh, sorry. Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, are we able to use um, some of the COVID monies to offset the increased expense of these items? Yes, that, that is the intent uh, to be able to, to use some of those dollars. We know that some of these are annual expenditures, but there's also those increases that we can use to be able to, to help fill some of those added costs. Okay. Right. Uh, do we anticipate something like the increase in the extra large gloves, you know, that Massive increase, do we expect that? Is that market fluctuations, or do you think maybe that will come down in subsequent years, or is that a, do we think that might be a permanent level? <laughs> we're, we're optimistic they'll come down in the future, but uh, um, we don't fully know when. Um, sometimes some of those prices will go up and they'll stay inflated above what had been kind of the market price, uh, but we don't anticipate that they'll remain at that level. Excellent. Seeing no further questions or comments, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving now to the school, the next year's uh, school budget uh, proposal and public hearing. Absolutely. As uh, Janelle pulls up the PowerPoint for this evening, uh, we'll be taking a look at the 21-22 budget. And uh, again, uh, this is a, a longer presentation, so I ask that you hold on to your hats, but uh, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, it definitely is a longer one. So, um, but as we move through, through it, um, you know, every topic, every slide, although it's not stated, um, ha revolves around these particular purposes, and that's meeting the funds of the Cedar Falls students funding the educational proprietaries of the district, as well as then understanding how the Iowa School Finance helps to meet those funding needs for that student. So as we take a look this evening, we're gonna take a look at the school funding formula and how it works, give an overview of that, as well as then our key factors in comparison of data, and that would be uh, local districts as well as districts similar to our size. We'll take a look at the levy rates, the projected property tax for our residential, commercial, and multi-residential as well as then we do need to take a look at the current certified budget for the 2021 school year and then we'll wrap up. So um, this uh, slide looks familiar I'm sure to most of you if I've shown this previously and, and we take a look at this because as a reminder this is our funding uh, fund accounting and there are three separate silos that I like to take a look at and that's our governmental proprietary and our fiduciary fund. Normally, we review each of these particular ones, and just like corns and beans, these funds can't mix. They're specifically for specific reasons. 
Tonight, we are only gonna take a look at the governmental fund. So, but within that, we'll take a look at the general fund, that operational fund. We'll take a look at that special revenue fund, the capital project, which is our save and our PEPL, and then obviously our debt service. So as we take a look at the certified budget, we also wanna take a look at the foundation formula. And this is set by the legislature. And the ideal purpose is, is listed on the screen, but the, the ones that I like to take a look at is, is the equity and ex expenditures. As well, it's, it's the purpose of property tax relief. We also know that it is pupil driven um, and it provides local discretion and incentives. The large one is, is it establishes the maximum spending control, uh, control, but it also is the same formula that is used by all districts, um, K-12 public districts, as well as AEAs. So when we take a look at that, uh, uh, the uh, funding formula, within the funding formula is the Aiden Levy budget worksheet. Um, this is a very complex worksheet. We definitely will not have time, nor do you want to go through that entire worksheet, um, but you will see throughout the presentation some of those uh, images from the aid and levy. But the purpose of the aid and levy is it implements the school a, uh, foundation, as well as then it calculates the spending authority. Um, it determines the total maximum spending authority, and then it determines state aid versus pr property tax. So, as we move forward with the funding formula, there are four key factors, and these probably look familiar to um, those on the board as well as those in the community as we've spoken to these uh, quite frequently, and that's enrollment, equalization, uh, supplemental state aid, and balance. And we'll briefly re uh, review each of those as we continue here this evening. So as we take a look at enrollment, enrollment is determined the majority of the funding received um, for the school districts. And that is based on October 1 count. And so for fiscal 22, um, the, the count in which we review is the October 1st of 2020. And so the enrollment, we uh, have our certified enrollment, take that times the cost per student, is 75% of your total general fund resources or your spending authority. The other thing you wanna take a look at with enrollment is open enrolled in and an open enrolled out because those dollars do follow those students um, to um, that uh, uh, specific district if they are open enrolled out. But we wanna take a look at certified enrollment versus served enrollment, there is a difference. And so when we take a look at certified enrollment, you'll see that uh, for, fis uh, excuse me, for October 1st of 2020, the district did increase enrollment of 85 students. Um, the red bar indicates the number of Cedar Falls students currently attending Cedar Falls schools. And then the gold bar are those Cedar Falls students that are attending other districts for a total uh, certified enrollment of 5,456.4 students. And again, that was an increase from the prior year of 85 students. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Um, I noticed in our open enrollment um, form this month that we have some virtual school open enroll students. How does that impact this formula? Those that are actually attending our virtual school will impact this formula as open enrolled students into our, as well as if they're attending another district for virtual, it would be open enrolled out. So those dollars follow those kiddos based on those needs. Yep, great question. So as I had indicated earlier, we do like to take, it, uh, take a look at comparisons. And uh, this is a three-year cumulative uh, change for certified enrollment. And this is similar size schools. And this is based on enrollment. So we have uh, five districts that are larger than Cedar Falls schools and five districts that are smaller. And you'll see for the three-year change, Cedar Falls schools um, had a cumulative change of 218.8 students. Uh, Prairie Valley, or excuse me, Pleasant Valley had 207.5. All the other districts, unfortunately, had a, a, a lower change within those uh, certified enrollment numbers for the last three years, specific to schools similar to our size. And this is based on um, October of 18, 19, and 20 certified enrollment counts. We also wanna take a look at special education. And, and the reason we wanna take a look at this particular um, screen is because the special education is a large portion of our budget. 
And in, in looking at this, um, historically, um, you can see where the numbers have, have fallen. Uh, for October 1st of 2020, we have seen an increase in our special education level funding, uh, level one and level two and level three, uh, specifically for the number of students attending Cedar Falls schools. But when we take a look at this, you have to look, um, it indicates a potential for a larger sped ed cost and excess of revenues. And so we wanna continue to, to review um, these particular numbers as we move forward as well when we're looking at certified enrollment. So the second uh, key factor is equalization. And this backs, uh, goes back to the 1970s where the legislation established a law that cost per student across the state will be nearly equal. It doesn't state it's equal, it says nearly equal. And the cost per student for um, fiscal 22 is $7,227. And you'll see that of that, uh, 190 schools are at that cost per pupil of $7,227. But there is then those school districts that receive additional in the maximum of $7,372 or a difference of 75, uh, excuse me, $145. And those districts, as you'll see here, based on a, a chart from fiscal 21, you'll see the difference of the 197 currently receiving the cost per pupil, but then, then there are those additional 130 uh, districts that are receiving additional funds. Now the legislature is currently working towards uh, closing that gap. Again, in fiscal 22, they did um, um, utilize an additional $10 to decrease that gap. Over the last three years, uh, they have decreased that gap by $25. Uh, just to put in perspective. So they continue to work on that, but it is slowly, but you will see the, the difference in regards to the funding and equalization for those districts. We also take a look at the supplemental state aid. And again, this is set by the legislature and governor. And the supplemental state aid is, is we look at the current uh, supplemental state aid of $7,048 for fiscal 21. As we are aware that the governor did sign the 2.4% increase for supplemental state aid, which is $169, that's added to that $7,048, and then an additional $10 based on the equity. So the new supplemental state aid is $7,227. I like this chart because it shows the difference between District A and District B and how they are utilized and what they receive uh, for their district cost per people. You'll see that District A, based on the district cost per pupil, will receive the $169 plus the $10 for equity, um, making that $7,227. But District B, who was already receiving those dollars, will only receive that increase of $169. So there is still that gap of $50 based on District A and District B. So the state foundation formula sets the expenditure of ceiling for each school district, a total of spending authority, and tells the school district how to fund its spending authority. So as we move on, we'll take a look at the supplemental state aid, and you'll see that on the uh, chart, um, the solid red line is that of Cedar Falls Schools, and the dotted line is that of the governor and legislature a supplemental state aid. Um, except for uh, fiscal 19, the district has run um, higher um, and w what I call new money, and that's based on our open, or excuse me, our increased enrollment over the past few years. And so this year for fiscal 22, uh, the district is to receive a little over 4% um, specifically to supplemental state aid. So as I mentioned, we do like to take a look at the comparisons of similar schools, um, size schools. Um, the district, Cedar Falls District, is ranked number 16 based on um, uh, enrollment count. Uh, you'll see that uh, for fiscal 22, the estimated amount to receive, again, as I mentioned, is a little over 4% or $1.5 million, which is, again, an increase of 85 students. The majority on this screen, and you'll see, and this is based on enrollment count five above and five below, had a loss of enrollment for fiscal 22, which then impacts um, the, the dollar growth as well as 
potential for a uh, budget guarantee, which then is uh, passed along to the local property tax. So we are very uh, fortunate as we continue to grow uh, with our open enrollment or with our enrollment um, that we continue to grow as this is with our district. And then we take a look at the similar size schools, the average. And again, this is just another way to, uh, to review, um, but the last three years on an average increase for Cedar Falls schools based on similar size schools is um, approximately $1.5 million for, for the average. And then the last and final uh, of the four is our balance. And the balance is the ratio of property tax and state aid supporting the district's budget. And the property rich districts will receive, receive less in state aid, but all districts are required to levy the $5.40 per 1,000 assessed valuation. The state comes in and backfills up to that 87.5%. We have our supplemental state aid, um, which covers the property tax increase, and then we have our additional levies. So that takes care of the four, four foundations, but we do want to take at the assessed, like take a look at the assessed value when we're talking about property taxes and what the rates may look like next year and the dollars that it will generate. Um, so the red bar shows the regular assessed valuation and the gold bar shows the TIF valuation. Overall, the district, or excuse me, uh, the assessed valuation uh, increased 3.2%. Um, but you will note that the TIF did increase um, compared to prior years. And the red bar, uh, again, the regular, uh, stayed rather flat for uh, fiscal 22. When we take a look at the TIF, then we want to take a look at those financial, uh, financing basics. And again, it's used by cities and counties and community colleges. And the city and counties adopt an urban renewal plan, and particularly for this TIF um, identification, this was for the Cedar Falls downtown street revitalization project that has currently been uh, occurring. And it establishes a base uh, valuation at the prior year's taxable valuation levels. The revenues on base valuation goes to all taxing authorities, and then the revenue on incremental valuation goes to the TIF projects. So what does this all mean? We're taking a look at the assessed valuation per student, and you'll see that, uh, again, the red line indicates the Cedar Falls assessed valuation per student, and the gold line indicates the state average. And for the first time, uh, the state average did increase um, uh, larger than the uh, assessed valuation for Cedar Falls schools. But the one thing to remember in regards to that is enrollment increases significantly um, don't always keep up with the valuations. And so it is very common to see a fluctuation into this. And so that is one item in which um, you want to uh, keep in the back of your mind regarding assessed valuations per student because of we have significantly increased enrollment over the last several years. So just a, just a question on this. So the numerator is number of pupils and the denominator is total assessed valuation. Correct. So that line tells me that our valuation is increasing faster than our students, number of students. Or the other way around? The other way around. The other way around. Yes. Okay. The numerator would be the assessed value and the denominator. Yes. I am so thankful we yes. have a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> that is a correct statement, yes. And a little bit of the challenge with those too, as, as enrollment decreased across the state, the valuations in many parts of the state stayed the same. So we have some <clears throat> smaller districts across the state that might have really a, a assessed valuation per student that is not even anywhere close to, to what the average would be. It would be much higher than that. So. This is, uh, it's good to have this as contextual. Uh, it just shows that, again, as we continue to increase enrollment, uh, as we look at the overall assessed valuations, that's, you have to keep that in mind. Okay. When you said 3.2%, um, I think, was the, for the regular uh, increase, right? I, I'm trying to remember what would the uh, previous years have been relative to the 32 
kind of on, on the same lines with regards to the increased mm -hmm. in property t values. So I, I've been involved with some of these different conversations for, for several years. Mm -hmm. There's been some years where it's been, you know, 5%, 6%. There's other years, as you can kind of just see by the differentiation, where it's been that 2 to 3%. Um, I think one of the, the aspects of this year is the, the gold bar uh, because the red bar is what we are able to generate for local property taxes um, and that gold section increase, which means we don't, uh, we aren't able to within our uniform levy or our, you know, the extra levy to be able to um, utilize those funds in the orange bar. So the red bar from last year to this year is pretty flat. And Andy, I'm trying to remember from my meetings with the Board of Supervisors, I think COVID impacted that because I don't believe they were able to get out and do evalu assessed evaluations last year. So I think they are anticipating going out into the community. So I do believe those, they do, they're anticipating increases for that. So that should work to our favor. It should, exactly. This is such a unique year that uh, we anticipate those changing. Uh, we think additional construction projects that might have been delayed because of, of the previous 12 months uh, will become you know, re-engaged and reactivated. So we, we anticipate that that will um, swing upwards. And again, our, our uh, city leaders have been very thoughtful the approach over the last 20 years as far as where and how growth will occur and infrastructure in place. So we, we're very comfortable that's trending in the right direction. As we move on, then we also do take a look at the evaluation per student in our area school comparison. And we take a look at those listed on the screen, which is Dyke New Hartford, Hudson, Jeansville, Waterloo, and Waverly, Shell Rock. And again, uh, Cedar Falls continues to sit rather favorably in regards to the valuations per student. And then this is just a three year comparison with those local for 19, 20 and 21 valuations. As we continue then, we do take a look at the similar size schools again, uh, with the five larger based on enrollment and the uh, five smaller. With the exception of West Des Moines and Ames, you'll see that uh, Cedar Falls continues to sit rather favorably uh, within that comparison for those similar size school districts. And then again, with the three-year comparison for the 19, 20, and 21 um, fiscal years. So really to get into the thick of things um, and taking a look at the fiscal 22 combined district cost, as I had indicated earlier, it is $7,227 per student. Now, um, as I had indicated that we are required or each district in the state of Iowa is required to levy the $5.40 per 1,000 assessed valuation, which makes up about $1,766 of that $7,227. The state comes in and backfills that remaining portion at about 68% or 4,882, which then leaves that remainder of $579 um, based on the district needs. And really in short, the state contributes about 68% and the local districts contribute 32% um, of that $7,227. We'll take a look then at the history of the cost per pupil and you see you will see that it has increased over the years again for fiscal 22 it did increase the 169 dollars which was the 2.4 percent as assigned by the governor as well as that additional ten dollars in equity and then again this just refers back to that combined district cost mixture of uh, the 68 percent on state aid and then that local district property tax of 32% as mentioned earlier. And that's rel uh, relatively um, consistent throughout um, the past few years. As we move forward then, as I had indicated earlier, we were gonna take a look at the aid and levy worksheet. Um, and uh, these are uh, uh, a few slides that indicate the cost associated to that breakdown of that complex worksheet. And with that $5.40, the dollars that are generated based on that is $11,233,958. The district does not qualify for the budget guarantee as we had uh, increased enrollment. Uh, therefore, no additional property tax based on um, our local property uh, owners. And then that final state foundation aid of regular program of $37 million 
And again, that includes our teacher salary supplement, um, the professional development, teacher leader compensation, early intervention, and then the property tax replacement uh, payment, which is also known as, as Peter. And then there's that additional levy, as I had mentioned earlier, which is the backfill. And uh, that calculation is on the screen uh, with a, a net additional levy of $5,649,625 of a property tax of $2.71. So bringing that all together, uh, you'll see the uniform and additional levy at $8.11. Again, that 101 guarantee. Uh, we have the dropout prevention, which was approved by the, um, by the board on January 11th. And to remind the board and our, our uh, viewers, um, that is for our at-risk and dropout program that we utilize throughout the district of a property tax rate of 46 cents for a total of $17,845,001 or a property tax rate of $8.57. And again, this is just a tax comparison within our local districts. Um, and you'll see uh, based on that for fiscal 21, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the district considers um, to continue to be rather favorable with the $8.49. And then similar school districts, um, our size, uh, you can see uh, ex with again, the exception of West Des Moines and Ames, uh, we continue to be right in that pact of the lower amounts for a combined district cost. And then this just indicates the property, total property revenue um, specific to the combined district cost and those dollars associated to that in our dropout. And again, uh, the combined district cost for fiscal 22 is a little over 16 million. Again, the district did not qualify for the budget guarantee. Um, and then the dropout of a little over $900,000. And then this is the rates that are associated to that property tax uh, for fiscal 22 and, and previous fiscal years. And again, they're rather consistent based on uh, the usage of that combined district cost and dropout rates. So one item that we also do take a look at is an instructional support levy, and that is a part of our general fund reporting. That is a 10 year uh, levy approved by the, the voters for our district. And that was through, that is through fiscal 22. Um, it is 10% of the regular district program cost, which is 3.9 million. There is the less ISL state aid of a million dollars. And that is for the support, um, the instructional support of 2.9 million for a property tax rate of $1.27. Um, just to remind the board and our viewers, uh, this is utilized for our kindergarten teachers, as well as our counselors, as well as our um, technology equipment throughout the district. These funds are utilized for that particular programs. And so when we take a look at that, you'll see the dollars generated specifically to uh, the property tax revenue, again, for fiscal 22 of approximately $2.93 million within that property tax rate, again, of $1.27, which has been rather consistent over the past few years within a penny or two um, for the tax rates for our ISL. Again, a part of our uh, aid and levy is our cash reserve levy, and there are two parts specifically to our cash reserve levy, and that is the school board review committee approved request. And those requests are specifically for the increased enrollment, open enrollment or LEP cost. And you'll see on the screen those particular amounts that were approved by the board on those dates, board meeting dates. Um, as well as then our special education, and that is excess cost above the revenues that we would have received, and that's $1.2 million, and again, board approved on October 12th of 2020. So the total SBR, um, R1, excuse me, SBRC number one approved request is $1,948,244. As I indicated also, there are two parts of this and the cash reserve is a second part. And um, in past discussions while reviewing our district financials, um, we had conversations in regards to our solvency ratio and the need to ensure that we continue to have our cash balances available to one, issue payments to um, as needed, but also to have cash on hand. And for this fiscal year, uh, you'll note uh, the recommendation would be to add an additional $200,000 for those cash flow needs for fiscal 22. 
So in taking a look at that, we have our SBRC1 and SBRC2 with our total cash reserves of 2148000 for a total property tax of $1.03 specific for um, our cash reserves. And again, this is the history in regards to the cash reserve levies. Now these will fluctuate and that's based on increased enrollment as well as our special education deficit as well as our cash flow needs for our solvency ratio. So you will see that um, the SBRC request will fluctuate as will the cash flow as well as then you'll also see the tax levy rates fluctuate based on um, those needs as well for the past few years. But again, for fiscal 22, you'll see that the cash flow is, uh, is approximately nine cents with the SBRC one at 93 cents. So what does this look like for the general fund? Uh, for the total request for our general fund with the combined district cost, again, uh, minus the uh, budget guarantee, the dropout prevention, which is utilized for our at-risk and dropout program, our instructional support, which we utilize for salaries and benefits and for our um, technology equipment, and then our cash reserve uh, for a total of $22,922,358, or a combined district cost, or excuse me, a general fund is $10.88. Again, this is just the uh, review of the total operating revenues received specific to that, and again, for fiscal 22 is approximately $23 million, as well as in the tax rates that follow uh, for our operating revenue or a general fund, uh, for fiscal 22 is $10.89. We also take a look at the commercial industrial or CNI state replacement um, estimate. And beginning in 15, CNI property valuations are being reduced through rollback. And rollback is one of the items we will take a look at um, up to 90% uh, in 15. And then beginning in 18, the CNI replacement uh, payments paid to the state become limited to the total payments for 17. So the district is estimating an 87% prorated payment. And when we take a look at that, the, the calculation is on, on the screen for you. Um, an overall calculation and the estimate for the general fund CNI replacement is $555,880 with the instructional support CNI replacement of $76,902. And then the general fund revenues, and I apologize that unfortunately did not pop up the accurate amount in regards to the categories uh, specifically to federal, um, but the state, you'll see that it is um, $38,732 uh, at approximately 57%. Um, percent. And then we have our federal, which is a little over 2.8 million or 4.23%. And that includes our Medicaid, it includes our title dollars, it also includes um, Head Start, um, and it also includes our recent funds of our ESSER funds, of the ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 dollars. And then we have our local, which is the combination of local property tax um, and other revenue. And that would be our open enrollment, um, tuition, as well as facilities and rentals and then miscellaneous fees and associated to our general fund for fiscal 22. That takes care of the general fund. Um, as you recall, uh, we are only reviewing uh, that first silo, so we do have a few items left to review, um, but they will be rather quick um, for your review. And this is specifically into management fund, and management fund is a restricted fund and it is a Board of Education controlled fund. And this is for the purposes of uh, property tax and, or excuse me, property and liability insurance as well as workman's comp. Um, it does have property loss deductible and early severance benefits if applicable. For fiscal 22, uh, the request or the recommendation is the $750,000, which is a property tax rate of 36 cents for a uh, thousand assessed uh, valuation. Now this is the review of the property tax revenue over the uh, past several years. You'll see that in fiscal 20 and 21, uh, that remained rather consistent. And that was the board had made the decision to utilize those fund balances available um, in order to utilize those dollars. But in fiscal 22, we've been notified um, that there is a hardening in the market. 
and that's because of the natural disasters and the frequency of storms that have been occurring. And unfortunately, we've been notified um, that it's a roughly 15 to 20 percent increase for next year um, based on our um, premiums. Therefore, their request and the recommendation of that $750,000. I mean, that is industry wide. That is not locally. That that is nationwide and industry wide. So, um, and then it, this reflects then, obviously that. Uh, property tax rate and, and that flexibility and that change within that property tax rate based on the needs of the district and based on the industry um, of notifications of received. So for fiscal 22, the property tax uh, impact is the 36 cents. We also take a look at the physical plant and equipment levy or PEPL. Again, that is a restricted fund. There's two parts to that. Again, there's a board controlled part, uh, part of education, which is the 33 cents per 1,000. And then there's the voter approved. And that's the additional dollar 34. And that was approved on December 16, 2016, which the levy expires in June of 2028. We utilize these, uh, these funds for the purchases and improvements of our grounds, as well as any construction and repair. Um, you're familiar with our 10-year PEPL plan that we present to the board on a yearly basis. It also includes any purchases for school buses and vehicles, as well as technology uh, for our one-on-one -on -one, uh, program that we have uh, for our Chromebooks. And then if there's any leasing and renting of facilities that are needed. Uh, as a reminder, this particular fund cannot be utilized just as the management fund cannot be utilized for salaries and benefits or general operating costs. It's specifically for these uses. So when we take a look at that, the PEPL for fiscal 22 is uh, the regular is $756,541. And then we have our voted of $3,072,017 for a property tax rate of $1.67. And again, this just reflects the dollars that are generated based on the regular and voted, as well as then the property tax associated to uh, that particular levy of regular and voted as well. And then we have our debt service, our last service in regards to a restricted fund. And this is to be used to be, uh, pay the interest and um, the principal payments based on bonds. And this is specific to voter approved bonds. And our, our community uh, did graciously approve these two specific bonds, the $32 million, which was approved on April of 2016, uh, which was utilized for the construction of Aldrich Elementary, as well as then um, the remodeling of North Cedar and Orchard Hill. Um, but then they did, the community also did approve the $69.9 million bond, which will be utilized for the construction of the new high school. The district has not uh, bonded for these particular dollars, uh, so therefore this year, um, but the, it is anticipated in fiscal 23 um, that uh, the, the need for those dollars as we continue for the construction. So it is anticipated there will be a change um, in our debt service levy in fiscal 23. So the amount for fiscal 22 is $2,371,300 with the property tax of a dollar three dollar yes excuse me uh, this then gives uh, an overview of that property tax revenue and uh, since the exception of the inception of the uh, the debt levy uh, and you'll see again fiscal 22 of that two million three hundred thousand dollars and then again for the history of the property tax rate uh, based on the need uh, to issue the payment for interest and principal for that $32 million bond. So in summary, um, we, uh, we definitely, uh, you'll see the general fund based on uh, previous slides that we've reviewed of $19,993,245 or $9.61. Adding those additional instructional support levy, our management fund, the voted PEPL, and the regular PEPL as well as our debt service levy. Total revenues would be $29,872,216 or a total tax rate of $13.95. So 
So when we take a look at this, I do like to show this screen specifically, um, and this would be for every dollar that's received in property tax, you'll see that 56 and a half cents of that is, is considered combined district cost. You'll have eight cents is debt service, and then uh, three cents is drop out and, and so on based on that, and that's based on for every dollar that is received. As well as I like to show this because this shows um, the control and the board control and the availability of control specifically to that uh, tax breakdown, property tax breakdown. Again, the legislature controls the combined district cost, which is 56.5%. It comes in then with community, and that is the voted PEPL, the instructional support and the debt service of 28%. So the board actually has control or has review of, of the um, cash reserves, the management, um, the dropout prevention, as well as then the regular PEPL and budget guarantee, which is approximately 15% of the total property tax breakdown. So again, as I had mentioned earlier, um, the property tax for fiscal 22 is the 1395. This, show, uh, this chart shows uh, in the red, um, the total, and then uh, with and without the debt service would be the $12.87. As we continue then, we take a look at the similar size schools. And again, this is based on enrollment, uh, five up, five down. And again, uh, Cedar Falls consi uh, consider considers uh, and continues to sit rather favorably throughout um, those uh, particular districts in reviewing. So as we move forward, we do take a look at the assessment and valuation of property, and that's the rollback. And this does really impact the property tax, and, and we want to keep this in mind when we take a look at that. It is based on Iowa Code 441.21, and it is adjustments in value to comply with the state, um, no more than 4%. The rate of adjustment is determined by the Iowa Department of Revenue, as well as the rate of adjustment is the same for all counties. So it does not change for the different counties. So in taking a look at the residential rollback, you'll see that there is a fluctuation. And again, as I mentioned, um, for this upcoming fiscal year, it did increase to 56%, um, and it has fluctuated over the last several years. So when we take a look at that for the projected residential property tax for fiscal 22 on a property valuation of $100,000, with the increase of the rollback to 56% and the tax rate of $13.95, we had a gross tax of $787 with an estimated homestead of $66.19 for a net tax of $720.89. And again, this is a total change of $21.93. So when we take a look at the property tax, this is just a visual to show on homes that are assessed at $100,000, $200,000, and $300,000 uh, based on fiscal 21 to fiscal 22. And as mentioned, that total change uh, for that $100,000 home is $21.93. And looking at our commercial, you'll see again that total change based on properties of $300,000, $400,000, and $500,000 uh, and taking a look at fiscal 21 and 22, um, for the property of $300,000, that total change is $16.21. And then we take a look at our multi-residential property tax. And again, um, that is property values of $300,000, $400,000, and $500,000. And you'll see a total change of a decrease of, um, for a property valued at $300,000 of $300.44. So um, we come to then obviously uh, where we have proposed the budget or recommended that budget uh, specifically for this evening. And then we uh, obviously will publish this proposed budget in the Waterloo, uh, excuse me, Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier on March 23rd with then that public hearing and adoption on April 12th with the uh, certification final budget and certification to the county auditor on April 15th. So that was a lot of information, and uh, I appreciate you holding on with me. So if there's any questions, please feel free to let me know. Why don't we go ahead and get the motion to set the, set the hearing and second, and then any questions or comments? 
I move the Cedar Falls Board of Education direct the secretary to publish the budget estimate and notice of public hearing as required by law in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier and that the public hearing for the 2021-22 proposed budget be held at 5.30 p.m. on Monday, April 12, 2021 at the City of Cedar Falls City Hall, 220 Clay Street, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jenny. Questions or comments? Lots of information here. <laughs> If I can just make a clarification point, within one of the slides, if we go back two slides, uh, you'll see that um, uh, multi-residential property is decreased, and, and that is due to legislative changes. Uh, the legislature has shifted the way that those uh, properties are taxed, so that you will see, and it's a fairly large decrease uh, based on where they are at for assessed valuations, um, which then shifts the burden to single property residential uh, parties. So that's one of the challenges that happened a few years ago uh, at the legislative level and something that we do not have any control over. Any other questions or comments? Just um, with the management fund, I think you know, we were all kind of wondering what <laughs> was gonna happen with um, the insurance rates and the benefits. I mean, we all were kind of holding our breath, not really wondering what was going to, how this was all going to pan out. And so, um, that that was a significant jump. I think of all the things that you shared tonight, that was probably one that stood out for me the most. But it's not that, that it's not surprising. And I'm I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm wondering was it going to continue to be like down the road? Um, is I think it's still relatively early on in terms of the overall impact that our country is experiencing so anyway but um thank you for the report thank you for the explanation and the way you walk us through this i really appreciate it thank you all right yep thank you very much um, As can i just make one quick quick yeah. comment I, I didn't know if you were um asking but I, I the um that insurance rate stood out to me too and i think you know the insurance increase uh, due to cost from extreme weather events, I, that is a that is a, a cost of climate change, mm -hmm. um, and that is something that will continue to show. Um, and I, I just am am grateful that we are taking that into consideration as we construct this new high school, and that we're um, ensuring that we have mitigation measures built into that high school in the building itself and in the landscape around the high school. That's the direction we have to go if we're going to try to. Um, avoid these kinds of, of increases in the future. So anyway, just a comment. All right, seeing no further comments or questions, we'll move to a vote to set the hearing. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Now we move back a year <laughs> and we go to the budget amendment for the current year. I promise this is much shorter than the last presentation. So if we could pull up the screens in regards to uh, the amended budget, um, this is part of our yearly process as well. And, and, and just to remind those that are, are reviewing and, and attending, um, this is for expenditures that were not expected in the prior year. And to remind those that are watching in, in here, um, this uh, budget amendment is specific to, uh, it was approved prior to the pandemic our certified budget. And therefore, there are expectations in regards to the amending of this budget for uh, fiscal 21. Um, and on the screen, it just notates the requirements as well as the legal obligations specific to the Iowa Code sections. But I do want to note that um, it is not an increase in property tax. It's just the authority to utilize uh, current re uh, revenue sources as well as the authority um, at, as to use for reserves as well. So. And taking a look at this, there are four areas of amendment um, this year for fiscal 21. Uh, the recommendation is to amend three of those four, and that is specific to instruction. And you'll see that amendment uh, from 47 million to the 48 million. And again, that is specific to the COVID-19 uh, mitigation um, that the district has utilized specifically for fiscal 21, as well as then the anticipated curriculum purchase for the district. 
as well as then our total support services. And again, that amendment you can see on that screen based on those dollars. And again, that is based on the COVID mitigation expenditures. And then finally, we have our other expenditures. Uh, and that is specifically to the construction of our new high school um, as we move forward with that and, and um, uh, hopefully break ground here very soon as Janelle had indicated the groundbreaking here in March um, with those expenditures um, amendment of 17 million to 23 million. There is a public hearing required just as is the certified budget. And so this timeline will look very familiar as we've um, established that proposed budget. Obviously we'll then publish that proposed budget in the Waterloo uh, Cedar Falls uh, Courier as well as then hold that public hearing adoption with that final budget amendment with the county auditor on April 15th. All right. Thank you. Can I get a motion and a second? I move that the Cedar Falls Board of Education set 5.30 p.m. Monday, April 12th, 2021 at the City of Cedar Falls City Hall, 2020 Clay Street, Cedar Falls, Iowa, as the time, date, and place to hold a public hearing to amend the current 2020-21 school year estimated budget expenditures. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Nate. Very good. Questions or comments? I'm not sure that I understood the increase to the high school construction. Could you explain that, uh, please? Absolutely. So that's just a, that's not an increase of um, it's just based on the timeline and when those expenditures will fall. It's not an increase of the budget itself. So um, there there will be uh, more expenditures based on the groundbreaking here shortly in March prior to the end of fiscal year. Thank you. And I say this every year, and I think it's important to note uh, the, the business office, Danelle, does such a wonderful job that our annual budgets are set again in typically March, early April for the following year. Uh, and we do everything based on line item estimates. So we really try to go down to what is the dollar amount going to be expended in each of these different categories where some districts will say, well, we're just going to set our budget at our max authorized expenditures and what our, our max authorized budget is. Uh, we do it in a much more scalpel-like approach, uh, which I think is important, but it also then lends us to needing to adjust those based on what might happen 14 months after the fact. So those other differences, I guess, I'm just curious if you can just give us a give us a give us a sense. For example, you know, instructional, you sure. know, instructional area. What what were what? How did COVID impact a, you know the instructional area? Do we have to hire more yep. people or uh, yeah? Absolutely. So there were obviously supplies that were required in order to uh, continue our services and continue and open up the the uh, the district itself. So when we had to order our PPE, our hand sanitizer, our filters, different things like that. There was an exceptionally amount of increased expenses associated to that that were not accounted for previously for our support services as well um, as you are aware we've been uh, running our buildings 24 7 based on the needs to ensure um, airflow and, and proper safety procedures so those dollars were not allocated and based on those needs for covid mitigation as well okay yeah. do we um i know it's it's nothing is finalized yet as well, but potentially um, with the, the federal dollars uh, pending uh, approval in DC, there is, there, there is information, there, there are items for school districts, school states, et cetera. Have you received any, uh, in terms of reimburse, reimbursements for some of these down the road that we haven't yet experienced, any, any projections or any you know, foreshadowing what that might look like? Well, um, today we, I had a webinar with the DE that shared potentially what they are calling the ESSER 3 funds. ESSER 1 and 2 are built into our budget and, and trying to uh, offset some of the expenditures uh, that we've had and know we will have into the future, especially as we look at you know bridging the learning gap that COVID provided, I think is, is kind of the catchphrase of, of the month. Um, but that's something we're gonna to have to do with, so with some summer learning, some other opportunities uh, to make sure that we're filling in what gaps could be there based on COVID. Uh, the the ESSER 3 funds, um, they're still trying to estimate what that could be and could look like, but it's a fairly significant uh, 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 bill that's passed out of the Senate and now is going to move to the House or did move to the House today. 
uh, and they're saying that will be larger than the two previous ones combined, and we'll just have to figure out <coughs> what are the parameters put around that because uh, there, there are still some defining components as far as what is the interpretation of what that can be used for. They are saying some 20% setbacks for some summer learning and, and filling in the, the um, learning gaps that could be, be present. They're saying some for infrastructure, some for other purposes. Right. And will that, will that go through the, the DE then? Um, through the DE and then disse disseminated however they were the need, all of the et cetera? Line. Yeah. So it flows through the DE. The DE has to disperse 87.5% of that to the school districts. There are some uh, state level requirements surrounding what they have to put in place with some of the funds. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, I believe there are just a couple other parameters as far as what the, they need to do to be able to be held accountable for, for some of those funds. So yes, it does go through the DE. It is through the Title I formula once again, which means there will be um, districts our size that will receive more money than we'll, we will and, and uh, some very different variables that are out there based on that Title I funding formula. Um, so last week, most of the residents of Cedar Falls learned of the cost of our extremely cold February in terms of utility costs. Is there anything that's going to be uh, the anything that we as a district are going to be facing in terms of increased utility costs from that that we know of yet? Yes, and CFU worked with us really well through that process, uh, communicated with what the spike was going to be. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the, the cost increase was, but it was like a 200 or 300 percent spike increase in, in uh, uh, natural gas as well as uh, just some of the electrical costs associated for the period when the um, now I pushed it from my memory in my mind. What Polar the, vortex. Polar vortex, thank you, <laughs> and what occurred during that time frame and, and certainly the impacts it had on some of our southern, southern states with the inability to get some of the uh, um, natural gas and electricity to us here in the Midwest. So there will be some cost increase with that that we did not anticipate. So since that's in this current budget year, is that going? Is this budget amendment that we're working at today already in, reflect those increased potential anticipated increased costs for utilities or are we going to have to do this again later? No, we, we haven't anticipated those costs and has inc included within this amendment. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, seeing no further questions or comments, we'll take a vote on setting a hearing. Uh, so all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, moving now to superintendent report. Well, one item listed uh, April 12th will be the, the, the budget hearings. Uh, we also, as Janelle had said earlier, uh, spring break is coming up and certainly excited about the warmer weather and opportunity to hopefully enjoy more of the outdoors, not only uh, with recesses and other activities, but certainly for, for all of our community and, and adults uh, across Cedar Falls. Thank you. Questions or comments from board members? I had a question about the virtual campus enrollment for next year. We, the virtual families and I assume the rest of the district received the notification about uh, the registration deadline, commitment deadline is coming up May 1st and I believe that's based off of open enrollment guidelines currently. Um, given that's quite a bit of an early date for a lot of families and because of the uncertainty of how the COVID pandemic will continue to play out over the summer. Uh, for student or families that are in the district already, is there any possibility of that deadline being extended beyond that April 1st or what's the, what's the plan for families who may not have all the information yet to be able to make a determination and is that April 1st date a lock-in date for the virtual campus? Yeah, so we, we said April 1st. It's not tied to the open enrollment. Open enrollment is actually March, March 1st. Uh, April 1st, we did that for staffing reasons because we need to now start setting schedules for next year. Um, as we look at when we start, set our secondary schedules as well as our class sizes and roster information, we start doing that uh, in April. So we have to make sure that we don't have wide variations and, and fluctuations. So all of a sudden we have sections of 
12 kids with other sections of 35 kids, especially at the elementary level. So we're saying April 1st is the time. Um, we anticipate that there will be some um, widespread vaccination options, certainly by the summer. So we, we anticipate some mitigation strategies going into next year that will continue, but we also hope at that time that uh, there will be a little bit more sense of normalcy than maybe what we have currently. Can you describe the difference between the process for this year and last year? Because when we went going into the school year last year, the families were families who were looking to enroll in the virtual campus because of COVID. You know, I, my, my timeline recollection of the timeline is correct. It was like um, mid to late July with some of those enrollment dates. Is there what is the difference between? you know, for the families who remember that timeline last year being so late and not necessarily of anyone's fault because of just how the pandemic rolled out. But those who remember that timeline and the shortness of the, the dates at that point, and now they're trying to, they're being asked to make the decision, you know, three or four months earlier than that. Yep. Can you just kind of speak to that? So those who, you know, they went through this process last year and now they're seeing like, oh, I have to make this decision now three months earlier. Yep. Yeah, so last year, obviously, as we build out our return to learn plan, that was done and not knowing what the pandemic was going to provide, uh, and then the state provided guidance. We did that with um, a need, what we felt was a need to be able to provide a, a balance of in-person learning for those that would wish to have that, plus a full online version. Um, the timeline dictated that we tried to get that done, I think, by July 10th or 12th, but that, I think, that wound up like July 20th or 25th mm -hmm. when that hard cut date was established. I think going into this year now we are looking at this not as necessarily a, a necessary component of our educational but more of a, an opportunity that's an enhancement for those families that see this as a learning style that best meets their family situation or their students learning style. So it's more of a, an opportunity as an opt-in option to be able to do this because it meets the needs instead of saying, this is something we need to do because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and staffing for us is so important. Last year, because of our enrollment growth, because of trying to balance class sizes, making sure that we were um, reducing spaces in, in, in school buildings to, to try to maximize social distancing where possible. We actually pulled back some of our instructional coaches into the classrooms and we wanna make sure that we come back to a sense of normalcy because we know how valuable our instructional coaches are to everything we do within our buildings. So that's why staffing earlier now is going to be much more important than last year where it was kind of building the plane a little bit as we flew. And Andy, I would say in a way, I mean, families actually did have this choice before. It wouldn't have been with Cedar Falls. It could have been like with the virtual academy. So it would have been open enrollment. Yep. So if families did feel that learning style was something that was appealing to their family, we're just kind of now taking that role on. So it is just an alternative pathway. It's not something related necessarily to COVID. So yep. kind of just looking at it through a different lens. Yeah, and we're excited that I think we can do some different things with dual enrollment now and some other options for students where it's a little bit more blended because in the middle of a pandemic, there are some options that were much more challenging than, than others. So it's just, there's some uniqueness to this that I think we can really fit um, some, really meet some needs of students uh, in their families uh, to be able to do some exciting learning opportunities. How many other school districts are now offering this i saw iowa city was actually listed as one as well Ooh, so i'd have to go to the de website they're listed on the de website i want to say last time i looked there were probably 10 uh, but i i would say it's probably closer to 15 now is, is the number of approved providers across the state so it's not widespread when you think of 330 school districts uh, uh, but certainly we're in a unique opportunity to, to provide that and i think we've done it really really well uh, Mrs. Eastep to her leadership with, with what we've done and it's a testament to our staff for how it's gone throughout the year that it's going to springboard us into next year. Do you anticipate that if your district offers this, can you then choose to go to another district for that program or how is that going to be kind of yeah, determined be, by the state? Yep, yep, they, they will allow that similar to just open enrollment that, you know, we offer 
a comprehensive high school in District A. If District B offers a comprehensive high school, you can open enroll between A and B. So uh, they will see this as just an opportunity or a program that families will have the choice to select which one meets their unique needs. I guess kind of just to maybe try to get, is there, in, is there not going, is there going to be flexibility in that date or is it kind of if you're not, the families have to decide by April 1st if they are going to be in or not? Yeah, we're seeing thinking of for, you know, families that maybe had like a child care situation change and we, uh, you know, the child care is such a big issue that was a, that was um, heavily affected by the pandemic that, you know, and you know, just those slots aren't open sometimes. So when families that had to give them up that maybe aren't going to be able to get back, find a child care situation that, you know, again, that's kind of, it kind of speaks back to that. Maybe they, some of these families may not have the information they need to make the decision by April 1st. And, uh, you know, again, the uncertainty, I mean, we're planning for trying to return to as much to normal in the fall of 21 as possible. But, you know, there's, there's going to be families that for them, the risks may still not, you know, the risks are still too high for them to take on. Yeah, that's I guess what I'm just, you know, I, I'm wondering if there's going, if that April 1st is a hard, fast deadline, if there's any possibility later in the summer for them to make another, you know, flip a decision into a decision or not, I guess. Yeah, April 1st is the date that we've set. Uh, we see that as a, a firm date. There will be a few little small tweaks and changes based on unique circumstances. We know that. Um, but the great majority of people that we've spoken to, there, there's some that really want to kind of have their, their feet in both worlds to make sure that they're kind of covered both ways. But most families that have said, yes, we're in with, with the uh, online academy is do, doing that for the reasons based on their family circumstances. So it's really an option that we're just providing for, for families. Uh, we need to know numbers so we can plan accordingly. Um, what we don't uh, want to have happen again is just those wide swings of imbalances within our class loads. And we, we saw that happen even as we were setting those this summer. And that was the need we needed to, to pull back and do some different things with, with some coaches. Um, and, and that's what we want to avoid. Okay, thank you. Yep. Could you give us an update on COVID and vaccinations among staff? Yeah, and again, testament to uh, Janelle Darst. Uh, she's really been the, the lead on vaccinations and, and working through all the contact tracing. First off, our numbers for, for COVID extremely low district-wide. Um, today was the final first round of vaccinations for anybody in our district that wanted to get a vaccination. Uh, we've also had, uh, by the end of this week, we'll have about 30% of our staff that wanted a vaccination that will have the second vaccination. Um, and certainly by the end of March, uh, all of our staff, based on today being the first of the last uh, vaccinations, all staff will have their second vaccination by the end of March, which is exciting. And a follow-up question to that. Uh, do you anticipate a review of our protocols as a result of all staff that want the vaccine receiving the vaccine? Um, so we'll work with Blackhawk County Public Health on that and, and look at uh, what they're recommending, what the best practices are, what we're hearing and seeing right now, just because of contact tracing and how much time that can put students out. Um, that is something that we have to review and look at so we don't have students that have to be out of school for, I think right now it's seven days based on contact tracing. I'm looking at Janelle to verify that. 10 days for contact tracing. Um, so we've got to make sure we walk through with Block Up County Public Health on their recommendations versus contact tracing versus time out of the buildings, uh, which impacts directly our students. And kind of the follow up to that, just thinking about, I mean, our, our, our buildings have done a tremendous job of being flexible or rearranging lunch schedules and doing all this as far as you know call it the the social distancing distancing aspects the masks um, I mean there's there's just there's just so many things that we've <laughs> we've that we've had to adapt uh, do is there any anticipation of those types of things uh, going back to normal anytime soon with the vaccinations uh, um. among all staff so there's some, some neat things that have come out of 
COVID, really positive unintended consequences that will probably continue. Uh, but there's also some things that people are very excited to no longer do. Um, so yes, we'll have to review all of those and continue to uh, get feedback. Uh, we, we talk and, you know, and work closely with Blackhawk County Public Health as well as other districts, just to make sure that we are um, all doing things with a balance of safety and security, but also to, to balance uh, how can we get back to, to some of those, those normalcy. Um, we do know that there's only what I think last data I saw, about 30% of adults that have received one vaccination. So we are still a ways away from some of those conversations, uh, what that looks like, but hopefully each day and every day we get a little closer. Uh, uh, speaking of un unintended consequences, if if our community is any reflection of the broader country, we have had to have had fewer students and or staff ill with the flu probably as well, which, which adds to more days in attendance, right? I, that was another positive unintended consequence, you know, with mask wearing, with some of the um, antibacterial washing of hands, other things that we've done. There's been a lot fewer instances of other illnesses, be it common colds, be it flu, be it, uh, um, just a wide pink, variety. Pink of eye, I know, was one that pink eye is down quite a bit this year, which I'm sure a lot of parents are not touching your face. Yeah. As much. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's been one of those things that we, I don't think we would have said last June that was going to happen, but uh, it was just a natural outcome of some of the mitigation strategies. Just a real quick question to go back to the virtual campus. Um, students that would enroll in our virtual campus. Um, how does that impact extracurriculars? So if you are in, there's like three different rules that go along with that question. If you are open enrolled in and you're within the region, uh, typically a kind of a contiguous uh, boundary, you are considered a resident student. You participate in the activities within that district that you're open enrolled into for that virtual campus. If you are a resident student, but you choose the pathway of virtual, the virtual academy, you are eligible for activities and, and any athletics at that time. We do have some students that are open enrolled from further away. So what happens there is they have the opportunity, even though they're virtualized, to be able to participate in activities in their home district up to two per year. And then that district actually bills us for there's a formula within the state of Iowa code for that amount that then we pay back to them after they send us the open enrollment tuition dollars. Okay. It gets weird. Thank while, you. Uh, while we're discussing um, extracurriculars, I understand the Iowa High School Athletic Association and the Iowa Girls High School Athletic Association have put a moratorium on practices and strength and conditioning for the last week of March. That's about all I know about it. Do you have any more detail on that? That's about it. Um, and Susie might have a little bit more information, but yeah, there's a moratorium for a week. And I think that's great to give kids that jump start and, and pause uh, for just between seasons, between activities. And it's just a um, lack of a better word, just an off week. The last week of July. July. Last week of July. July. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for the questions and comments. Seeing none, no further, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Jeff. Is there a second? All second. Thank you, Sasha. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.